tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed. And a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to Tinfoil Hat. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Are you ready to get your mind blown? Good morning, Swarm, and welcome to Tim Paul Hat. You know who I am? You know what I'm here to do? I'm here to rock! Joining me as always, Xavier Guerrero, and on the ones and twos, Jay Nice, Juicy Johnny, Johnny Woodard. Woo. Yeah, we're in it. Very excited for today's episode. Listen, guys, go to samtriplee.com for all my dates. I'm on the road, hanging and banging, bro, out there running and gunning. Every bumper sticker you can come up with, I'm doing that right now. Tons of dates, Pottstown, uh, Skank Fest, Morris Plains, Austin, Dallas, Batavia, you name it. More dates to come. Bow, 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 bow. And anything you need, videos, audio, everything's on samtriplee.com. New t-shirts are up. Everything's there, so go check out samtriplee.com. We are in it. Uh, very excited to have our next guest on. Um He's, uh, I've always enjoyed our conversation. He's never a boring talk. He's always adding new pieces to the puzzle. I'm very excited. His podcast is Eon Bite. Please welcome Miguel Connor. How are you, brother? Thanks for having me. Good to see you, my friend. And did I mess up your podcast name after I said it 15 times? No, just there's, sure? there's no, there's no right. We weren't there 2000 years ago. So okay, perfect. Greek, perfect. It's ancient Greek. Who knows? Eon, Aeon, Bite. Eon, people Aeon say it Bite. There we go. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on. Always enjoy our conversations. For those who may not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where our listeners can find you? Yeah, my website is, yes, it's right there, thegodabovegod.com. Uh, Aeon Bite, if you type it in, A E O N B Y T E. And my website has it all. It's my. Uh, my wheelhouse of Gnostic and Hermetic alternative spirituality. It's got the podcast, videos, books, uh, articles, everything else from uh, yeah, a wide range of topics uh, around the, again, the ideas of Gnosticism and Hermeticism and so forth. Um, oh, Go to the top. What, what, God above God. What does that mean? Well, that's, that was actually uh, Paul Tillich. He kind of, he was an Orthodox guy. But in Gnosticism, there was always this sort of idea that you had the, the God of the Hebrew Bible, the God of laws and structure and all that. And the Gnostics contended that there was even a higher God, a, a being of pure light and pure consciousness that they thought was the true God. So uh, that's just what I call the website. Okay. All right. Interesting. So uh, a, a fun conversation, you know, as you know, I am. Uh, I'm. I've been reading the Bible now. Uh, then I. What I do is I read the Bible. Then I go and I find a YouTube video to explain to me what I just read because I'm functionally illiterate. Okay, <laughs> and I'm trying my hardest there. So uh, I, I'm really into this. But I also know that that based on my whole my whole journey, that I also know that there's energy manipulation within this this realm we live in whatever this realm may be and you know that is the discussion um where do you sit on all that where do you sit on uh abrahamic religions and you know energy manipulation and all that stuff well i'm a big fan of all religions all cultures i think they have value it's all man's quest trying to find himself and of course, uh, the Bible is great because it really is the history of human consciousness. It is uh, one of the oldest recorded uh, narratives of humans trying to come into the world, trying to deal with the world, trying to find a relationship with the divine from various forms and how the individual rises into the collective and so forth. So, of course, I find value. I find value in all those religions. Now, 
What do you mean by energy manipulation, though? Uh, so I do believe in, like, um, manifestation. Oh. I believe in uh, abundance that, you know, that the universe rewards you for giving it away, helping others. Uh, you know, it's almost along the lines of what we were talking before we came in, which was, um, which was, you know, it's, it's, it's not about me, right? Isn't that kind of what you said? You kind of got into this place where you realize yeah. it's life not, is a, not about me. Yeah. Life is not about me. That's what I'm talking about. And like Johnny was talking about how he tries to, am I speaking out of, out of place by saying no, what no, you no, said? No, no, no. It's off? difficult to internalize is what I said. I, you know, I, it's the best piece of advice ever, but it, it takes some work to internalize that and make that real for you. Oh, I, I mean, we're talking about black belt mental levels here. Like, I think one of the greatest levels of black belt is realizing that what people think about you is none of your business. Like it, that is so hard to get to, but when you, when you kind of like comedically, I've had to get to the point where it's like, cause I come from, I come from people who go to war. They go to war. Like you disrespect, they go to war. And I have learned to not do that. So in comedy, I've come to, and we'll get into all the spiritual stuff, but in comedy, I've come to understand that you have to give people a little bit of room to talk shit, especially comedians. You can't take it all personal. And if somebody doesn't like you and you go, what did I do to this person? And the answer is really nothing. Then there's nothing you can do about it. And, and you're kind of right. I've been to some green rooms, and I've heard some homies talk about homies. And it's not hate. It's just homie. It's just, like shit, you said, people, it's just talking. People talking shit. Yeah. Like, if I got mad at every podcast that mentioned me and called me a crazy <laughs> conspiracy theorist, I would have no friends left. I got to go, oh, that's funny. And you embrace it. Because old Sam would be like, you want war, dog? You want war? I'm going to put three years in the morgue. That's how Triple used to be. So... That's where I'm kind of at. What are your thoughts on that? Because you did mention that you're kind of in this place where uh, it's not about you. What does that mean to you? Well, I think, yeah, I think uh, oddly enough, I have been doing some manifesting work in the last month. I mean, I do believe we all have an important purpose in God's world, uh, a unique quest to make the world a better place and help uh, the least of our brothers, as the Bible says. But uh, what I like about manifesting is uh, whether you're doing uh, Abraham Hicks or Tony Robinson, you name it, is the idea of getting your vibrations up until you get into a state of complete, intense gratitude and happiness, and you're really embedded in sort of the, the higher world or life itself. And yes. what I like about manifesting, too, is that, for example, there's this trick that you do that you try to manifest. But at the end, you say, oh, but I don't need it. <clears throat> and you realize that it's the gratitude and the energy that really gets you there. And of course, it opens your channels to get what you want and what you need. But also, if you get yourself in the right vibration, you start realizing there's a big difference what my ego wants, what my reptile brain wants, and what my higher self or the higher world wants agree, bro. in my life. With If I can separate those then life is great because I'm on a, you know, like the Blues Brothers, I'm on a mission of God and everything yes, is a, as it should be. Yes, dude. And, you know, it's so funny, man, because, like, again, I'm in this real spiritual place and, and I'm open-minded to hearing what, what are the pieces of the puzzle. You know, I'm always looking for another piece of the puzzle. And, you know, when you talk about your higher self and this spiritual, you know, I believe there is a, a higher spiritual reality, a higher vibrational reality, and this is the lower vibrational reality. And what I'm coming to understand, and this is why I'm trying to fight my sex addiction so badly, is because I really do believe that we are in the material and the more we engage in the material, the more we get away from spirituality, which is the more we engage in the low frequency, we get away from the high frequency. And that's really what I'm, so like, and it, like guys, 
I, make no doubts about it, I'm a knuckle dragger, okay? And I'm trying my hardest to be a <laughs> spiritual ape, bro. It's really hard for me, man. But, man, I am trying. So please understand, I am I am telling you this as much as I'm telling myself this, okay? Or the other way around. I'm telling myself this as much as I'm telling you this, okay? So it's like the more you engage in the f- physical and, you know, like, like the, like, I believe sex is a spiritual act and that we have degraded it into just like a kind of sport and who can put up the highest numbers is like the winner. But what have we seen about every, like, let's just study all these people that right now are kind of getting in trouble. Uh, Richard, uh, you know, uh, Russell Brand, Chris D'Elia, you know, Okay, Brian Callen, I I have to say him, even though I, I I I don't believe any of it that was said about Brian. Um, but you know, and Brian will tell you his sex addiction, he engaged in too into it too much. Look what we're doing with women right now. And we got this everybody's OnlyFans. These these women are like yelling about their body count like they've done something, like they've achieved something. And you know and there's consequences to that. There, that's what I'm saying. And like, no matter how, like we have that one democratic lawmaker who did like chatterbait and now it's blowing up in her face. Logan Paul's chick, who is a smoke show, bro. <laughs> like dude, Dylan Dennis just keeps putting out these pictures and I'm you like, love it. dude, she's winning right now. You're helping her win. Isn't but, it though? It's all this, it's all this frequency that just, it's like the gritting your teeth. We're all just on this 10, you know, we're all at a 10 all, and that's that sex energy is at that same level. Yes. It's like, ugh, and, ugh, everybody is, you but know, the just, masters are able to like exactly, kind of yeah. detach yeah. from that. What are your thoughts on that, Miguel? And then we'll get into what you, re- what you came here for, which I'm super excited about. Oh boy. Sex. Well, sex, as I was taught recently, is just another form of information. It's a media. It's genetic information, it's emotional like information, that. it's uh, ancestral information. But and so how we use it must be used wisely, how we use any form of media or energy, <clears throat> whether it's uh, money or something else, it's all energy and it's all information. So seeing it from that point of view definitely makes a difference. And a lot of it, unfortunately, is, uh, as I say, it is trauma, most of, you know, sex addiction and yeah. all that. and. It is something that happened to us as children or older. It's become warped and it is manifesting at adults. The, the truth is very rarely it's just getting your rocks off. That's not what's driving it. There's so many unconscious forces that are moving through you until you can understand those and uh, see what's going on. The addiction or the problems aren't going to change. It's a, it's a simple, it's simple, but it's very hard. But uh, we've sort of uh, lost that and seeing sex as simply uh, a form of information and then what drive us, what makes us want to mate is uh, a, a complex, a legion of reasons from programming to our parents, to society, to something bad that happened to us as children that warped us. So yeah, the solution is information to this information, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And it's like to get back to what it was. I don't know how you put that put that back in the box. I think that cat is out of the bag. Good luck. But just know that that is the energy you, you are playing with spiritual fire, I think. And it's easy for me at 50 to say that all of his friends. Yeah, there, like, there's a, like one theory, which I thought it's wild. I mean, obviously when two people have sex, you know, there is a genetic code exchange and some people, there's actually an, even an ancestral energy exchange. You just don't exchange DNA, but you exchange all the people you slept with, all your ancestors. It's like one big party. So, act, you it's know, like a block if you act party. that way, you'll be more responsible. You got to be responsible because you're bringing eternity. You're bringing creation, your whole lineage into this party. That's, I, I, I totally agree with that. See, but I know what you're about to say how everyone keeps saying, well, it's not fair because Sam already yeah. running and gunning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's telling us <laughs> young guys to not run and gun. But honestly, running and gunning now is scary too, though. Cause it's totally th- scary. If you hook up with 20 chicks, one of those 20 might be a little fucking snatch. It might be like, he raped me when yeah. she just she just didn't like way, you. By the way, one? A bunch of them. Yeah. There is complete and utter collateral in, in, in stating something that didn't happen. And we've weaponized regret. 
And it's just the way it is, dude. Yeah. When you get sober, man, and you're drinking, and you, I mean, you quit drinking, you see how, like, much alcohol is a part of the mating process. In, like, women always like, oh, you're just drunk saying that. Hang out with them when you're sober. You'd be like, you don't drink. It's They look at you like you're weird because that's part of the, the, the mating yeah. ritual is it's almost like an excuse to act up. You know what I'm saying? Then afterwards, you're like, oh, I was too drunk. To, I just <laughs> drunk being stupid. That's not really me. You're like, now it's like... Now it's like super duper, uh, like it's dangerous in many different ways, man. Like we've allowed the, 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 the weaponization of regret, like that kind of like guilty feeling that everybody has sometimes when you're not being proper in the spiritual, uh, uh, ritual that you just had, right? It's part of being accountable. You were there. Yeah, dude. You yeah. were there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy. And speaking of a guy who had a lot of sex, uh, <laughs> Elvis Presley, I'm very excited to get into this conversation. I'm, uh, I am I, I told you before the show, I listen to Elvis' channel on Sirius Radio. Dana listens. The kids love it. The dog loves it. Everybody loves Elvis. And there's a lot coming out about Elvis right now. And we'll see how much people love him by the end <laughs> Of this whole thing. And what may, you know, it's like very interesting because Elvis kind of was uh, blessed to be born when he was, when everyone pushed out accusations. Okay, we don't need to talk about that. Whereas now it's like somebody can just be like, I didn't like it. Oh, take away everything he's got, all that stuff. And we'll get into that. But where do you want to start on Elvis, Miguel? Well, I love. I'd like to say that everybody got Elvis wrong, and we can discuss the reasons. Who we think was Elvis is not Elvis. There's so much more, and I write about this in my upcoming book, uh, which will come out yet next year, American's Magician. And uh, my book, I mean, there is a lot of sensationalistic conspiracy theories. I mean, he was like the cottage industry for this stuff, from the National Enquirer to books. But everything I've written about Elvis comes from the, I guess, the horse's mouth comes from Priscilla, the Memphis Mafia, his spiritual advisor, friends, family, all that. I mean, it's all there in the bios. And it's amazing that the world still clings to this idea of him being some sort of a Southern Christian country boy. When he himself, so you right. might say, was uh, an occultist, but even the word doesn't make sense. He was more of a a full blown shaman. He was America shaman, and his his uh, career and destiny, I as I write in the book, was completely faded. He was meant to come out and lead this country to this new post war America and into this new age, and we can talk more about it, but. Elvis was not Elvis, you think. He was somebody who was uh, steeped into alternative spirituality. He was a follower of uh, Yogananda before the 60s Beatles and all that. He was a follower of Madame Blavatsky, uh, Manly P. Hall. He was well-read in all sort of occult literature from uh, Gnostic Gospels to Freemason texts to uh, the I Ching, the Kabbalah, you name it. And he practiced a lot of these sort of esoteric disciplines, whether it was uh, he did sex magic uh, with Ginger Alden, uh, very responsible sex magic. He was into meditation, yoga, all form of uh, sort of uh, ceremonial magic. I mean, he was really steeped into this stuff. Plus, he, uh, as I as I argue in my book, he was a probably the greatest magician we've seen in modern times. He was a natural born magician. He could manipulate weather. And again, if there's a person what? that was never alone in history. It was Elvis. There was always a crowd watching him do his shit so he could manipulate weather. He could astral travel. He could read minds. He could have these visionary prophecies. He could uh, he would do these tricks in front of people like put his hands out and the bushes would shake or force fields were come. I mean, the more you study, uh, I studied Elvis, the more just so impressed how 
this way he was like the gandalf of north america if you would he was a, the greatest mystic i say probably maybe even western thought in western civilization nobody could match him as a natural person as a deep reader as a seeker his greatest goal was always he wanted to re reconnect with god and help humanity he would say that over and over again I want to know what my purpose is, and I want to help as many human beings with my music and with his healing. He was a natural born healer. He could heal. He healed heart attacks. He could heal. Priscilla had a headache. He would put his hands on her head and heal it. Uh, he healed his grandmother's arthritis forever, just putting his hands and over and over. Plus, just to add a little bit more, he had several massive mystic encounters and several ufo experiences extraterrestrial experiences and he wasn't alone in any of those there is witnesses after witnesses that saw these sort of extraterrestrials visit the king and that's that's just scratching the surface okay, Let me okay. Know. i feel like and, we and, covered you are, so and i have much to crap. say you are responsible for this book coming out in a way if you want to know about that okay oh. yeah yeah <laughs> I'm trying to manipulate Johnny right now with my force field. What, what, what is that? I'm wait, trying wait. to manipulate hey, you. Hey, man. I no, man. I don't, I don't, I'm don't. i crushing your I, head. I crush your head. I don't okay. So you got to have a get, Tennessee let, accent when you do that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Let's <laughs> let's, uh, let's get into how I've made this happen because I love hearing about myself. So uh, let's – well, how did <laughs> – tell me that. And then we – there's so – you got in so much. I feel like we just – flew through so much i like i, I want i like we got time info so, bukkake i mean it was just it was <laughs> it truly was an info bukkake right there came from everywhere sure. yeah, yeah. 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 just didn't know where to start yeah i was okay. like okay and plus when the book comes out uh they're probably we can do more but yeah i didn't know anything about elvis like last summer and there was a series of events you could say mystical that included ayahuasca ceremonies and meditations and suddenly elvis came into my mind and you guys have watched Pulp Fiction, right? Yeah, for sure. You remember that scene where uh, Vincent Vega is like pouting and Mia Wallace is like recording him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she goes, there's two types of people in this world, Elvis people or Beatles people. The two can like each other's music, but they never will be together or the same. Who you are, which person you are tells us who you are in this life. I always thought I was a Beatles person, but after these supernatural experiences... I became really uh, like I couldn't stop listening last fall to Elvis in the car or anywhere. I just couldn't. And I never I'd read one biography my entire life. I I eventually watched the Bass Lerman film. I didn't know anything about him, but I couldn't stop listening to him. Halloween, I never dress up for Halloween, dressed up like Elvis over and over. And this voice kept like bothering me, insisting that I needed to do something. And in January or last year, February, this year, February, with no uh, experience or knowledge, I started writing this book and it took like six months and it's been accepted by a big publisher. And all these new things about Elvis came out and it was actually in April, I was really tired. And you know, Sam, here in the North, it's April, it's still kind of snowy, it's dark. You're like, fuck man, when is spring gonna come? I'd work all day. And of course at night I'd work my ass off writing this book. And I was just sitting there and I'm like, oh, it's 11 at night. I got to work on this biography and I, I needed to decompress. And I put on Rockfin and I said, I need to listen to something. Oh, I said, oh, there's Sam. And he has a ask me anything. And I never listen. I listen to your podcast, but not your ask me anything. <laughs> I'm just not into ask me anything. No, it's totally fine. It's totally And fine. I said, I'm going to listen to it. And as you're taking questions, you kept looking at the camera and going, caught in a trap and you kept doing it over and over through this podcast <laughs> and i was like this is a sign you know caught in a trap we're trapped in the simulation mm -hmm. and i remember going shit this is the sign i need to keep working on this book and i just work really hard you just going caught in a trap i love it bro caught in a trap everything <laughs> happens for i think about that all the time hey guys real quick i want to tell you about our friends at black buffalo Okay, listen, Black Buffalo, the world's only smokeless tobacco alternative that delivers the same experience as traditional long cut and pouches just without any tobacco, leaf, or stem. If you're over 21 and dip or chew, 
pouches or long cut, check out award-winning tobacco alternative Black Buffalo. Black Buffalo is everything you love, nothing you don't. The feel, the taste, the ritual, just without the actual tobacco leaf or stem. You can take pride in what you do. Take pride in what you dip. Honor your rituals with Black Buffalo. Buffalo. Black Buffalo makes all the best flavors like wintergreen, mint, straight peach, and even blood orange with or without pharmaceutical grade nicotine. Okay, you can buy Black Buffalo online at blackbuffalo.com. Promo code Tinfoil. Tinfoil. <laughs> or thousands of retail locations across the country by checking their store locator on the website. Okay? We love it. You love it. XG loves it. Ooh. Everyone loves it. Okay? So if you're over 21 and use products like this, it's time to join the Black Buffalo herd. Head to blackbuffalo.com. Use the code Tinfoil at checkout for 15% off your first order. Use my code Tinfoil for 50% off your first order. And one last time, that's promo code Tinfoil for 15% off your order. Join the Black Buffalo herd. Okay, so I'm a uh, Miguel. I'm gonna tell you where I'm at with everything, and we're gonna get this will lead us back to Elvis. So I'm starting to get. I, I, I'm right now. I know some people are gonna get angry at me. I'm kind of a Christian mystic, right? I'm in the Christianity. I, I, you know, the things that we've talked about still resonate with me a lot. You know, uh, getting into the mysticism and the energy and all that stuff. I think when God sends down the fallen, and I, I you know, again, I was talking like to to Hindus. I go, is there any story in in Hinduism about fall? He go, yeah, they tell me this. Talk to the Vedic astrologers. They, you know, the four uh, entities that he sent down the trap down there. So that story's told over and over again. So my belief is where I'm at, and you know, under three episodes from now, I could come in a totally different guy. <laughs> I'm always opening my mind to different material, trying to find out what, what makes sense to me. Okay. And I'm very early to reading the Bible, but I'm just being honest with everybody. My belief is that the God of what the God cast down, sent down, trapped down entities, whether it's 33%, four, two, whatever that number is sent down, trapped in this, in this, this reality we live in. And by doing that, he, they created a realm of consequences and a realm where you can manipulate the energy. So, so you know, they talk about when angels, like angels fell in love with the daughters of man, right? Yep. And uh, giving them the forbidden knowledge, which was like what? Makeup? Come on. How, yeah. <laughs> how many times you see like a woman with no makeup on no. Instagram, then she has all the makeup and she goes from a four to a 10 and you're like, that's black magic, right? <laughs> So I do believe in that, and this will bring us into that, so that you can manipulate energy and we all have a vibration, and that some people have different vibrations. So when I used to have a show on television, it was called, um, it was called uh, Wild World of Spike. And on this show, we would watch videos and react to them, okay? It was a, it was a watching a video reaction show. Man, okay? you've been doing that a long time. I've been wow. doing that since I was 35 years old. Wow. So you, just so you know. It's like you, it's like you invented it. Yeah, so I did invent it. I think people would do that, but it <laughs> yeah, was a reaction. I mean, you would video. never claim that. Yeah, Anybody yeah. who would claim that would be a fucking idiot. Would be a crazy person. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, okay, that that the guy on my show, his name was is still Jason Ellis. And I would just watch how just like drawn to him people were. And I always said he had the Elvis factor. He always had the Elvis factor. And the just, there's just, everyone has different vibrational things. And it's almost like when, when everyone thinks one person is going to make it, and we talk about this a lot in sports, where like an unknown prospect will just blow up and everyone has a weird reaction to that. Because his energy isn't that of the, the prospect that everybody was going to say that's the sure hit. Yeah. And then someone comes out. It's like even Brock Purdy from the – everyone's like, oh, it's not going to last. It's not doing well. He's too like, – they just can't accept that this guy that everyone was wrong on has the energy to do it. So going back to what we're talking about here is like I – you know, you're saying that, that Elvis was kind of a shaman or uh, I forget how you pronounced it, but – I believe that. I believe that some of us 
are either star seeds come down, sent down by the heavens to to, and I think you are the one that talked to me about. It's either you or Von Galt. It might have been Von Galt that talked about how God sends down star seeds to push humanity in different directions, and that could have been. I'm not saying Elvis was Jesus or anything or Buddha or anything like that, but. I think they send people down to 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 lead people in certain directions and and bring in certain stuff and they they just have the you know Taylor Swift regardless of what you think about her you know there's something about her that people are drawn to her that she's selling out the Staples Center 15 times in a row and where maybe there's magician musicians that probably could put out very similar type music and get no traction would you say Trump has that Trump has that, right? One hundred percent. Not saying again that Trump is. No, he's a not star Jesus. Scene. Yeah, we're not saying that. We're just saying he's got uh, people that meet. People say that they when they meet him, they don't see what they saw on TV. They're like, all of a sudden, he's like, you get you like him. He's got it's his magnetic, charisma. Yeah, yeah he's it's got magnetism. charisma. Yeah. So I I believe that. I believe that there are people, and I and I've always said that he. I say it all the time. Oh, he's got the Elvis factor, and that is just somebody who just resonates with people, in a, in a in a way, that just. You just either you have it or you don't have it. So what what are your thoughts on all that, Miguel? Oh, well, yeah, I would definitely agree. Again, I think he was uh, destined when speaking of Elvis or Trump, think of Hermes, the trickster. I think uh, whenever we come through a, a changing of an age, this uh, manifestation of Hermes comes, the god of doorways, the great trickster, uh the god of journeys but not destinations and elvis had it. elvis did read the book of enoch so like you said this idea of the nephilim of the watchers he was very much into he was into the whole cosmic christ idea but he was definitely destined and unfortunately by being destined he was also broken because of this i mean most people especially got Trying to uh, argue with Boomer Elvis fans is one of the most painful things in the world. <laughs> but he was completely broken as a child because there's this concept across the world called the wounded healer. And those in the tribe who have that second sight, who can see the other worlds, travel the other worlds, are usually children that have incredible trauma. Yes, I know. MK Ultra. Why do you think MK Ultra does? I totally why do they do this that. stuff with it? because they can break the children and open portals to other worlds elvis was so broken by the death of his twin by the what again boomers don't want to face by the abuse of his mother by the witch blood that his mother gave by this tornado that killed 200 people in tupelo when he was one year old it was one of the most traumatic events uh by just horrible poverty people don't realize how poor he was there were some nights all he had to eat his family all he had to eat was cornbread and water they lived in this sort of a north korea state both southern whites and southern blacks it was it's horrible when you read about it so he came through this sort of horrible trauma that opened all these channels of communication and he started having weird dreams, voices in his head. He was a, a horrible sleepwalker. He was, uh, again, he and his family, especially his mother, they could see into other worlds. So all of this came on. And, it, you know, when it was time for him to grab his destiny, go into Sun Records, he was already just so full of power and magic. And he changed the world. He changed history. This is no secret that from uh, people like Leonard Bernstein to David Lynch, they say, no, Elvis is the most important cultural figure of the 20th century and maybe all American century. He didn't just, he really created American culture as we know it for better or worse. And he really led this country after World War II into this new sort of, uh, this new manifestation that the world had never seen and we can talk about some of the the forces that created elvis if you want or let would, me know what direction i you would love go that i would love that i think that's great and i think i think people need to understand like this gets back into the notion that you know I, i'm sorry but it's like we are white people this white people that elvis was poor as shit man like he was broke and there's there's a lot of that out there and this gets into the cultural wars and the 
uh, you know, the, the, the psyops being ran on us and allowing to cause division and all that stuff. But yeah. So let's get into what, what do you think? How, how this Elvis, the Elvis that you know of uh, manifest. Right. Right. And of course we have to think Elvis was very much into gospel and the blues as people like uh, Chris Knowles have talked about is the Pentecostalism and the gospel was just drugless bacchanalia. It was this altered state of mind. He and Gladys were so into it, and that gave him power to see, and not just him. I mean, obviously, Johnny Cash, Little Richard, B.B. King, they were all influenced by this gospel, who back then was controversial. People used to say that uh, Pentecostalism was just mixing sex and salvation, and it was. But he was also into the blues, which as we find out, is very influenced by hoodoo and very animistic African religions. And Elvis really grabbed onto it. And what happened, as I show in the book, it just, again... His, he was the bro, the wounded healer, the MK Ultra child that had been broken and opening portals. This magic of gospel and the blues affected him as well as another generation of singers who could, like you said, they had the Elvis factor. They could really move mountains and get into the souls of people, and they were almost magical. But we have to understand how much America changed. After 19, after World War II, after the desolation of the Great Depression and World War II, uh, this country completely pivoted. I mean, we went into this sort of Eisenhower America, and uh, it was a completely different country where suddenly this we had so much money. And also, to the technology. That's one thing that bringing back Chris Knowles, I think you've had him talking about his yeah, landmark. Uh, yeah, the Lucifer technologies. You've got... Here's human civilization, put, 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 boom, the Sumerians, we pop out of nowhere, civilization. Then humanity starts going, put, 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 1947, for whatever reason, you can say Nazis, aliens, we got smarter, I don't know, boom, we shot up again, and the United States is, and the rest of the world is creating this incredible technology, satellites, transistor radios, the television, I mean, Suddenly, technology is shrinking the world and really advancing humanity. And the leader of this movement is the United States. We suddenly have this very consumer society. We have a society where uh, suddenly uh, spirituality becomes very, in- people become to in- in- in spirituality. The races are starting to blur. Uh, so many things. And who do you think both represented and sort of uh, pipe pipe us through this? It was Elvis in the 50s. He both represented it and he led it. You have to remember that there was a generation, Elvis came before the boomers, and this generation suddenly came into this new world where the parents are making all this money, two cars in the garage and all that. And they're very guilty because of the war and the depression. So they're just doting on their children. These teenagers had a lot of power, they had a lot of money, but they were also suddenly waking up in a world of nuclear threats and communism and the and media showing them disasters and wars. And there's a whole UFO thing. They realize, oh, shit, this is a new world and it's bad, but I'm going to enjoy it. I want to explore. So they start exploring alternative music, spiritualities. So this sort of postmodern, consumerist, extroverted, warlike, but still very syncretic in spirituality and race, that was Elvis. Elvis, both he was like the egregore or the manifestation of the egregore. He was the Hermes, the shepherd, that led us from this past America to this new America. He is American culture, and in a strange way, we kind of need him back. I mean, again... He was civil rights before civil rights was really a thing. He was liberating women's sexuality and personality <laughs> before. Yeah, they say he was really the first time in history that you could objectify a man's body. You could look at his hips and ass and crotch, and women could go, oh my God. They could look at the way we look at women. Elvis taught women, you can do the same. You can be free. You can be wild and intelligent and all that. Elvis really taught that. 
the word teenager didn't even exist in up until the 50s. There was no such thing as a teenager. You were a kid, and all of a sudden, bam, you were thrown in the field or the factory or whatever, or in, yeah. in the army. Yeah. Teenager suddenly became this new thing, this new case, and Elvis was there to lead him for better or worse through the 50s <laughs> into yeah. this new American empire. You know, so how does that sound? Well, that's pretty sounds, amazing. Huh? Yeah. I, I, what I find very interesting is something you said about what World War II does. And, you know, the occult, there is light and there is dark. It is, you You mentioned Hermes a lot, you know, the Hermetic principles. Do you find those to be good things or bad things? I think they're great things. I, I do Hermes too. Hermes has a lot of you know, early Christians loved Hermes. The, the 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 Byzantine Empire honored Hermes. He had a lot of wisdom for people. I I I too see the Hermetic principles as a blueprint to manipulate the energy and the manifest here in this realm. I do believe that. Yeah. I found it very interesting when you because a lot of people have talked about what how the world changed after World War II. Like, uh, suddenly we dropped nuclear bombs and now we have aliens, we have uh, <laughs> portals, we have all sorts, like, something changes, you know? Something changes in this world. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, we've had great wars, but there was something about World War II that was just a little bit different. And maybe it was that the the television, television, was uh, more prominent during World War II. So there was other things going that, and, uh, you know, and let's just face it, man, you know, whatever the Nazis were into, they were into the occult and they were into dark entities and dark forces. And we talk about that all the time, the manipulation of energy. I don't believe, I, I don't believe magic is good or bad. I think intentions. We've had people on that disagree with me that, with that, but that's okay. This show's all about letting people on and say what they want to say. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, that that think something changed during World War II. And mm -hmm. I, I do believe in that because, you know, Operation Paperclip, we see the Nazis come over here. America, just like Miguel said, went from, uh, you know, very innocent uh, and religious to suddenly uh, open-minded to alternative ideas. And whether that's good or bad, I think it's on an individual And a warlike basis. empire, and good a, or bad. And, yeah. and we start getting into what I believe is what is becoming a very apparent right now is that, uh, you know, magicians, I call them sorcerers. Sorcerers have hijacked America. We were so young we were very innocent at the time. We had this great constitution, this government that worked for us. And then the George Bush death cult kind of brings in the, these dark entities that begin to manipulate stuff. And, you know, the, the free thoughts and all that stuff, I'm very open-minded to all that. Uh, but there was some darkness brought into that as well. Again, we talked about earlier on with sex and how, you know, sex, the, the sexual revolution was all of it good. We don't know yet. We're we're seeing the, the 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 results of that as we speak now. So, yeah, I do believe that that all that what you're saying is like that. Uh, Elvis comes in right at the time after World War II. He was he served in World War II. Comes back and there's just a new energy in America. Things have changed. Flush with cash. Now we're a war empire. That and the and and what comes with that? We're still a war empire. Just the money's a different. The exchange is different. So, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot to that, man. I really do. I think there's a lot to what he he represents uh, energy-wise, the loosening of the, the loosening of, 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 is it morals, do we say? Is it just s cultural standards start to change? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Again, we go back to the Nephilim or the fire from the gods. It's always a double-edged sword, but for some reason, America had to change, and uh, Elvis really represented and spearheaded this change. I mean, he dominated television, dominated the movies, he dominated the radio, he dominated what women were talking about, he dominated what men want to be, or sometimes what men want to hate it, because he 
many times they tried to kill him. He got uh, the old guard mad. I mean, Frank Sinatra was really pissed off and said, oh, he's just a flash in the pan. Uh, Billy Graham denounced him as a Satanist. Uh, his own pastor turned on him, even though then Elvis really believed he. I mean, he was a uh, he would go to church every Sunday. He was a Pentecostal, but there was this sort of change where the old guard got mad, and the new thing had to come in. And again, with Elvis, it was all right. We are going to be more multicultural. We're going to accept black culture art and music we're going to accept other forms of spirituality we're going to make sure that women have more of a voice and all these changes whether you think they're good or no, not no, no, you i know, think they are the, good the tricks the thing with the trickster and myths whether it's native american or greek is that when the trickster comes he comes to change things whether you like it or not life is not about us it doesn't matter change is coming and it's how you deal with it that yes. matters. <laughs> yes. I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> Change is coming. Yeah, I, mean, I deal with that in stand up right now. I've I, I am more than willing <laughs> to be like, maybe I'm outdated. I, I sit there a lot. I think that but anyways, enough well, about me. So do do you think that they let him run? Kind of like they let NWA run? Do you, you think okay. the media let it run? Like, hey, let up because I mean if the media wants you to shut down, look what they're doing to Russell Brand. Like if you they can shut you the fuck down with crazy allegations or kill you or whatever. Do you think they kind of let him run? We're like, hey, let him swing the hips on. I don't think they're shutting Russell Brand down, by the way. I don't think they have uh, the power well, to do that. I right? think they're trying right but now. But they can't. I mean, he's on YouTube. What are they going to do? No, but they want him off TV. He still has a, no, he they're, has they're, a thing they're on trying to get him deplatformed ain't work. from YouTube. And whether, whether, whether it works or not, that the intention is different. I don't think it can happen anymore, though, with guys like that who have who didn't make their who or at least now don't make their bones. You know. Uh, uh. Well, uh, again, this is a different subject, but this is all a demoralization campaign to get you not to question authority. That's what they're right. doing. This is all about Alex Jones getting a trillion dollar lawsuit. They don't expect that to ever get paid off, but they want you to go, oh, dude. If I say something, I can lose a trillion dollar. Like it's <laughs> all demoralization. That's what it is. But back to this, I don't know, man. I mean, we do see after World War II again. Uh, I, I believe uh, a, a dark uh, magic coming in, uh, whether you believe in um, the, you know, Operation High Jump and the meeting with the, with the White House and the Nazis bringing the aliens going, you're e either we're fucking or I'm fucking. Which one is it? Right. So we don't know which way it is. OK, so it's interesting. It's it is interesting and what he represents can like is it good i i personally think here's what i think about cultural revolution i think it always starts out with a pure idea of we're all equal regardless of your skin color and what happens is the elites come in and go okay we can't have that they infiltrate everything and then they man molest it and manipulate it and then it starts going into more weaponized ways. Like, should women have equal rights to men? Yeah. I mean, do we like it all the time when they talk? Probably not. Right? Would we we like to have the guys kind of talk and zip your pie hole over there? I think we all would like that. But ultimately, human beings should be free and they should all be free uh, equally. Well, spiritually, that's something else. Legally is a totally different thing, in my humble opinion. That's just how it is. And I think... I think the biggest problem we have with voting and all that stuff is we have very uneducated people participating in the voting process and not voting off of logic, but voting off of uh, emotion, which is why democracy probably is it, it does have some faults to it. When you give everybody equal say, if you believe in voting, a lot of people that listen to the show don't even believe in voting. They think it's all just, you know, uh, just a festival of stupid, right? So, but if you believe in it, all of us, all of us should have equal say. The problem is no one has equal. They don't equally work on knowing what is actually going on because they're, they'd rather focus on other stuff. So, uh, I do believe that, you know, the cultural revolution, I do believe in equality and I believe in all that stuff. I, I live and let live. I believe in all that. So I think that is good. But what happens now is, you know, after Elvis, we see the sixties come in. And then the 60s become like we see over and over again FBI and CIA informants infiltrating movements and moving them in, in the more weaponized way of going. 
So that's what it is. I'd like to get into what Elvis, what what are th- uh, the things that, you know, you talk about how he like Yonanda and Manly P. Hall. Can you go into that a little bit more? Like, what are some of the things that we get, if we looked at, we go, oh yeah, he's totally right about that. Well, we have to, again, his idea, he was always a seeker, even as a kid. And he was always just the nicest kid. I mean, uh, Gladys, uh, I say, abused him because she did too much helicopter parenting when, her, you know, his brother died and they was found out she couldn't have more children. She was so possessive. But she always, her and Vernon always taught Elvis, we are all equal in the eyes of God. Nobody looks up at anybody and so and looks down at anybody. And they really held it. But Elvis was always a seeker. Again, he was he was a devout Christian. But during his rise to fame, he got angry because he felt he was betrayed by the these churches and he he got really sick of the damnation and hellfire and the hypocrisy and money of christians so he was kind of looking in the army he would talk to for example people at at the where he stayed at this hotel he would talk to the owner every day about reincarnation he got into khalil gibran's the prophet and all that so he was always seeking but he was also kind of struggling because he also really loved Jesus. I mean, that was always his guy. He had like two voices in his head, Jesus and his brother, Jesse, who was always talking to him from the other side. But then he got famous. He left the army. Gladys died and he was kind of lost. He got into the movies and he felt really disillusioned with the world completely. By 64, he was just sad. He felt like empty, shallow, even though he had, you know, he had a hundred million dollars in the bank and the world. He was the number one box office draw. He was already the goat in music. He was already, you know, the Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan. Everybody knew he was the goat, but he was depressed. And then he met, he got a new hairdresser who started, uh, and again, with these sinks. They started talking, and his hairdresser gave him these books like The Impersonal Life and some uh, Rosicrucian books and all that. And suddenly his mind just like exploded because he realized this concept of the cosmic Christ and the Christ within you and how we were all part, we all had like a divinity within us, and it was all up to us to help each other and not take the world so seriously because ultimately it was an illusion and only God's love existed. And this led him down through many paths. I mean, again, he got into Yogananda. He would study the I Ching. He got into uh, numerology, astrology. I mean, anything he could get his hands on to create sort of his system and everything. And he certainly believed in this idea of... uh, what do you want to call it, ascended masters or the white brotherhood that history gave these wise people, whether it was Zoroaster, Buddha, uh, it didn't matter, all these other Jesus, and history would come up with these great heroes that would help mankind get better. And Elvis was like, I could be this person. He wasn't even thinking of money or anything. He was like, I want to reach out to people and wake them up in any way I can. And he knew his music was one of the best ways to do it. So he became, again, very spirit. There were times in the 60s, twice he almost quit. He quit. He almost quit the entertainment industry. One, he wanted to go to a monastery and just forget about the world. And the other, he wanted to go to the Yogananda Center in the, when he was in LA and just become like a Buddhist monk and just meditate. But he was talked out at the last minute. So yeah, of course, he everyone's seeking. like, hey, 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 hey let's, not, let's not do anything yeah. stupid. Uh, come on, come on. You know? <laughs> yeah so uh and he had his struggles again again he had his demons uh when the people asked priscilla do you think uh what would happen if elvis would have not died in 1977 she was like no nope, he was doomed he said there were certain he had certain demons so did his father and mother they had this darkness again we go back wounded healer the mk child it's like you open the portals you get the good energies with the bad energies yeah. and she always felt he was doomed from the start i mean there's his destruction was inevitable and even when you do like uh an- anthropology with shamans shamans always are have so much responsibility to the tribe 
it's very normal in whether it's in the Amazons or, the, or other places. The shaman will eventually his body will break down, his mind will break down, and he'll become a drug addict and he'll die a drug addict. It's almost like you're carrying, you're the spiritual uh, uh, sharpshooter or whatever. Or it's almost like those sin eaters. Do you know those? You remember you hear the yeah. sin eaters where like yeah. you would pass away and there was somebody who would eat the food and take on your sins so you didn't go right. to carry them into heaven yeah it's a very famous story and it sounds very interesting to to me and that like this that we're all on this journey and we could do all, whatever we want but you're on your journey and where you are is where you're spo supposed to be and i i 100 percent believe all that like where you're where you're going is where you are right now is where you're meant to be and your job is to figure out how to elevate yourself out of that position right there and that in turn is a part of your journey as well and you know i find it very interesting man i find it very interesting that this guy who had it all and when when i hear you talk about how this guy's going nuts i go oh nobody's ever going to be happy right you know it's <laughs> like if you're elvis and you got everything you possibly want and you're still uh, like depressed i mean that just lets me know that 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 depression is part of the journey, and that it's there to tell you to change your life up. That you're yeah, supposed you to go different. You also have to life. remember, Elvis didn't give a shit about being rich. The one reason he got into the music industry was to help his mom and daddy. That's it. His dream was to be able to afford a house for his mom and buy her a pink Cadillac. He was. He was really the very uh, giving human being, and he was even when he was rich. His when you look at it, uh, all the stuff he did for poor people and friends, and all the money he gave away, and, and even then he would do, and even crazy things like he buys friends a fleet of Harley Davidsons. Or I wish Diamond. I had a friend like that. Yeah, <laughs> but he would used to do just amazing things like. Uh, he heard about this lady in Memphis who had no legs and she would go on like a, a cardboard with skates. And he saw that in the news and he would run to the store and buy the most expensive electric wheelchair and go to her house and just drop it off and buy. Or, you know, he heard about the farmer next to Graceland whose truck tractor had broken down and he was in financial problems that he just like buy, buy the guy a brand new tractor. He was just... He was very giving and very grateful that he wasn't poor, that he'd come this far. And he really felt spiritually and uh, materially he wanted to help as many people as he wanted. And he often went broke because of it. He was uh, he was crazy in his spending. Well, it, going broke as Elvis Presley. I mean, that's wild. That's a lot. But of he could make the money back. It's not like, you know what I mean? But there were times when like Verna was like, uh, son, this is bad. He's like, well, I'll just go on tour. But yeah, he. <laughs> yeah, I, get, I wish I had that. Right. I'll just go on tour. <laughs> That's it. He wasn't worried. He knew he, he was the magic man. By the way, you said saying. you wish you had friends like that. Didn't somebody give you a car one time? Yeah, but it was a, like a beat up <laughs> okay. Mustang that that he won in a poker thing. But okay, good point, Johnny. Good yeah. point uh, about uh, giving stuff away. Who owns Graceland? Uh, his granddaughter does. His now. granddaughter owns it because wow. his daughter Priscilla passed now. away, and oh, yeah, Priscilla yeah. just passed, and she left it to her, the granddaughter. No, who, Priscilla's still alive. No, Priscilla died. Lisa oh, Marie. Oh died. yeah, you're right. So Priscilla has it? I thought she was out of the whole Either picture. Priscilla or his granddaughter or they're kind of a joint thing. The granddaughter. Yeah, because Dana's very into Yeah, it's this. Riley Keough that owns it now. Yeah, but yeah. word was that uh, Lisa Marie spent all of his money. So we go, hey, man, you you lost $100 million? Dude, yeah, in 1950, that's probably like a billion dollars. But, like, how many times we've heard pro athletes who get, like, I mean, like, Antonio Walker – Got the first like hundred million dollar contract in the NBA and lost all of it. It's crazy, like right. lost it all. Like how crazy is that? The, you know, well, the leeches come out once they, you know, everybody. I got this idea, dude. I tell you why. And even though Elvis practiced this, but Elvis, Elvis probably had expensive taste. But if you spend all your money on yourself, on things for you, you lose all your money. If you spend your money on other people. You get more money. That's my well, he honest. He just told point. us that he gave he gave a lot of it away, right? Yeah, I think yeah, that's, oh, yeah. that. There, there, there's never a bad way to give away money. 
to help others. I, that's my belief. And this is just, again, energy stuff like law of abundance. Give it away. You get it back. You just that might not get it back as dollars. That's important. No, know, you'll right? get it. Yeah, I mean, different ways. Different ways it will grow. But, like, I, I really do believe this. Like, as long as you're not living in low vibrational shit, like, if you're doing drugs and living in the material constantly, you can become homeless. But if you're living high vibrational activities, I think the universe will always find a way to help you survive. And I get what you mean, because low vibes, I got like some friends that make some pretty good money, but they still live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck because they want to live that low vibe, like, oh, look at me at the club. I'm like, Every Bro. stripper you know is yeah. like that, right? Yeah. They take that money, <laughs> they give it to their boyfriend who plays uh, Xbox all day, and, they, and then they got to take a taxi to work when they can afford a thousand cars. It's just the way, to, and man, but if they would take that money and say, giving it to their boyfriend to spend on stupid shit, and they just gave that out, it would come back. I'm telling you, dude, I've just seen it happen in my life. So that's probably why Elvis was always able to make it back all the time, make all that money back, because he, he was supporting so many people. And dude, there's so much awesome shit about Elvis. Like he represents a, a lifestyle that would be so hard to le live right now. Loved karate. Loved karate, bro. Loved it. Had like Loved four, he had like four black belts. Yeah, I mean, dude, if I could live where I could just train. Are those like honorary black belts? Though? How does that work? <laughs> no, I think no, he was legit. No. Really? Okay. I think he was legit into karate, dog. That's so crazy. Well, look at this way. He got a black belt in 1960. And he did it because even though Elvis was always armed to the T's, he had guns yeah, everywhere, yeah, holster. Yeah. I mean, he was just... He loved guns. Again, the American Egregore, the American Hermes. But he also used to get attacked all of a sudden by jealous boyfriends and husbands. So he started practicing karate in oh, the military. So funny, in 1960, dude. when the United States was a nation of 170 million, he was one of 100 people with a black belt in this country. And then he really popularized the whole thing because... Again, in the 60s and 70s, he's doing karate in his movies, Vegas shows. He's He would have at his parties, he's like <sighs> kicking people and giving <laughs> demonstrations. He was way before Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. And <laughs> oh, he was he was ahead of the curve. And yeah, he was uh, he was and he was so good. People could say, and I have it in the book. He could, if you had like uh, back in the days, you had your pocket with a cigarette pack, he could just turn around and knock the cigarette pack out. Out of your pocket. That's cool. And he had so much I love force. It. I mean, imagine being around Elvis drunk at a party, you know, oh, or he's a little high and he's the like, best. Hey, hey man, come I stand have over stories here, of that. Okay. Yeah. We'll yes. get into the, the, the debaucherous side in a little while, but you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the best story is like, have you ever heard about Elvis at the White House? No. no, you've never yeah, heard this story with Nixon? Dude. with Nixon. Oh, it's the yeah, best. Yeah, yeah. He just wanted to go talk to the president. So he f did he fly right to the White it's House? Something. Yeah, it's something. Hold on, he I'll flies yeah, to the it's, White it's... House with a gun. He's got a gun in his like karate. He like lands on the lawn. Yeah. And he just shows <laughs> up with a gun because he wants to talk to Nixon. Yeah, 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 yeah. He is the king. He got he through the... Secret Service. They, they searched him and they forgot his ankle holster. And he's like. <laughs> Showing Nick said, hey, they forgot this. And Nixon's like, oh, shit, am I going to die? Is this guy an assassin? <laughs> Imagine being taken out by Elvis. Nixon gets taken. That would have been the greatest Bro, moment in the history Bro, they would the never States. allow that today. There's nobody that could get a gun into the White House except for Hunter Biden. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and that gun would probably have to look like an eight-ball cocaine, bro. That's the only <laughs> There's nobody else that could get a gun into the White House that is in Secret Service. Ever. Yeah. Right? Well, they searched them. The Secret Service did. Search. It was traditional, but they they forgot. Yeah, and like, the funny are... thing is how he got there. Yeah, he got in a fight with Vernon about money, and he got angry, and he flew the coop of uh, Graceland. And he just he went to the airport. He shows up at the airport. And, you know, he, Elvis never carried a wallet. Why would he? He was the king. <laughs> and the lady's freaking out. He's like, can you give me a ticket to Washington? I got to do these things. And the lady gave him a ticket. And he's like, just bill me. And then she said, okay, can you, uh, are you carrying anything? And he like opens his jacket and he's got guns everywhere. <laughs> so security comes and takes him and security asks him for his uh, autograph. And they let him on a commercial plane, just armed so to the teeth. Only <laughs> Elvis could get away with that. And then he shows up at the White House gate. He writes a note. And then the next day, Nixon sees him. It's like, who was a real king? 
Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you know what's interesting? Women would send him packages and they would be in the package. What? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Huh? Right? Like they, they ship their box in a box. That's they would, crazy. They would ship because he had a thing for animals, right? So they yeah, would the ship, animal lover, yeah. He, they would ship themselves as like a dog. Hey man, here's a dog for you. And he and he would hear them go. They would hear him go, no, just send him down to the the to the the shelter. And then they would freak out and jump out of the box. <laughs> Be like, no, 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 no. Like that's how that's much a, that's fucking wild. Right? But we see that yeah, like there's always uh, yeah, an entourage of hundreds of women wanting him. He sounds kind of miserable, honestly. Everybody just always asking something. Well, you, you never know who truly cares for you. That I think that's yeah. a big issue. Oh, I can't who imagine. truly cares? That's why he kept his family so close, I guess, right? It's right? Yeah. Those the only people yeah, he lived there. with his grandmother, his parents, his cousins, his uh, uh, high school friends. Yeah, he had, he had filters around him, no, for sure. Is it true that, I mean, do you really believe that women were fainting for him? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Caused, he could cause Dude, a riot. He caused no riots. Uh, there's this story about the Beatles that in their early concerts... The, the women would get so excited that there were literally rivers of urine down the aisles because they were just all no. peeing themselves. And I'm sure the same happened with Elvis. Well, now real? we're finding out the Beatles yeah. was probably staged, but with Elvis, it was the peeing? real. Well, I don't, I've never heard oh, about the, the peeing, but the oh, screaming and the fainting. Interesting, because I, I, I don't think you're off here. Now we're entering very dangerous territory. So you said there's two types of people, Elvis Beatles, people and yeah. Beatle people. You're uh, the guy well, running. No, I was an Elvis guy first. I mean, I, I grew up with Elvis. I love Elvis, but yeah, I mean the Beatles music to me is sort of an evolution of that. I would say. Yeah. But I, I do, I do think there's something to like, I mean, the Beatles loved Elvis, the Beatles that were Elvis yes. people. So, so, you know, uh, like Dana forever worked with a director named, um, Oh, fuck. What is, Wayne Isham. I can't believe I, I I had a brain fart there. Wayne Isham, one of the nicest guys. I've thanked him in my uh, el- my my first comedy album. I thanked Wayne Isham uh, because he's like the first... Like, I, I met like comics who were famous and cool, but it was the first time I met somebody outside of comedy that was very famous and very cool. And, the you know... Wayne's claim to fame, he was voted number one video director of all time by MTV back when that meant something, right? In the heyday of MTV. <laughs> uh, but he he blew up Bon Jovi. And you know how he did it? He faked that they were an arena act. So what he did was, uh, and this is going to what uh, Miguel was talking about with the Beatles. Sorry, Johnny. We're just discussing <laughs> it. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I don't have any problems with any of the PR stuff. I'm just talking about the what, music. What, was, what they did was they got like 100, 200 people, extras to show up. That This is back when they spent money on music videos. And they would, they would shoot like... First, they shot them all on the bottom area, so it looked like the bottom was f- packed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they shot them in the stands, so it looked like the, the stands yeah. were packed. And it gave the illusion that Bon Jovi at the time was an arena act, which then he became. Because back then, if you had a hit music video, you're, you're, you're the biggest star on the planet. I don't know if there's anything like that anymore. You'd have to do Rogan like five times, I think, to, <laughs> to get that. But um, yeah. I do believe that that is... That is, uh, that's kind of what we're talking about here with the Beatles, that they knew the Beatles were big in England. People act like England is Europe. It's not. It's a very small part of Europe, okay, which we can still get into. How does, how does England, how does the pound, how is that so high when they got no natural that's exports? How, tell me how you do that. Oh, yeah, empire still. <laughs> yeah. Right? But. So the Beatles were big there. Travis Stock, there's a big discussion on what, what they represent, where they put together all this stuff. Travis Stock. Yeah. Travis Stock. Ta- Travis Stock. Ta- what I say? Travis Stock. Oh, Travis Stock. You're right. I'm an idiot. So luckily, I'm still an idiot. Uh, so they brought him over here and to present when he flies that people go crazy. And there is something about women that are a little different than men. Men, like, we love sports, but when women get behind something... Like culturally, it spreads like wildfire. It's like the crazy. The, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Like Taylor Swift, Matt Rife, you know, uh, uh, Sex in it, the right? City. Yeah. Uh, it's like they Twilight. All, Remember Twilight? Like twi- it just, just goes crazy. All sync yeah. up, 
And that's like why periods. they're constantly, maybe, that's why they're constantly throwing stuff to see if they can get women culturally behind it. And once that thing shows that's that... why ESPN is trying to make WNBA happen, because they're just praying that women it, it suddenly... It will never like, happen. Yeah. Ever. It will never happen. Like that's the, I, I I believe that when you say that because I honestly think even if like they put Kim Kardashian, Cardi B all behind WNBA, I still don't think it'd work. It's just that thing where it's just nope. nope. I mean, I mean, like if you walk, the funniest thing about female comedy is when they when female comics go up there and go, oh, I don't need we don't need men, right, ladies? Well, you've just talked about your pussy for an hour <laughs> and dating stuff, so you do need men. Every <laughs> podcast. You know, you know, and I'm not judging. I love them all. They're all great. But it's like, stop saying you don't need men. Everything you base off is is, is like all of your, I mean, Taylor Swift sings nothing about, about boyfriends hurting her feelings. It's like, maybe if you learn how to go down on a guy properly, you might not have the problem anymore. Sam speaking, not Miguel. Uh, Be promiscuous. You need a dude. Yeah, 100%. You're you yelling about your body count. That's a lot of bodies you need right there. <laughs> so, I mean, it, that seems sex in the city was about the liberation of men. and it's very interesting because i was on adam carolla and he was breaking down like there, i guess there's a sex in the city remake reboot yeah they're doing it now yeah. right and it's a television show i think so yeah it's called like uh oh i can't it's an it's a word so, it's a phrase from one of the shows so like, that show is geared towards who you know oh. to f- childless women. women who like decide to pick career over that stuff and you watch it because the guy who is her boyfriend in the show right he has a son from another relationship and guess how the son is depicted as super annoying <laughs> which totally fits in yeah. to mm-hmm. all of these women who are looking for love in 30s and 40s and they they're dating men who have children from and how would they see the kid who's always calling up crying always calling up needing stuff kind of the dad picks them over the girl as annoying right it's like so interesting Instead How, of instead of being considered a good dad, you should always pick your fucking kids well, over your girlfriend. That girlfriend should be like, damn, that's a catcher. Because yeah. when I ha- when he has my kid, he's gonna yeah. pick my kid over. One hundred percent. Everything is a everything is a sorcerer's magic trick, dog. It's all pushing a narrative. It's so interesting, dude. I, I find I, when he told me that, I go, oh, that totally plays into what they're trying. They know who their demographic is. <laughs> Women who didn't get married, who are still trying to date. Yeah. Which is, hey man, ever teach your own, I don't care. Uh, let's get into some, let's get into uh, Elvis's UFO encounters. Can we get into that? Yes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Again, let's he, uh, go! Let's go. Yeah, he read the book of Enoch, he read the Orantia book, which people into that uh, connection of religion and UFO love, the Urantia book. He read uh, Chariots of the God, Ooh. Von Daniken's bu- book. He certainly said that there were aliens and he thought they were watching us and maybe stopped uh, the wars. And it, he would tell people, don't be afraid of them. That's okay. There was one time he was with one of his uh, groupies, uh, Wanda June Hill, and he starts like talking about, I'm from the ninth moon of Jupiter and I have uh, these powers. I'm here to help a better, I'm here to make a better world. And she claims that suddenly his eyes turned blue and he started like glowing. I don't know. This is kind of sensationalistic. And Elvis also, he was a huge troller. He loved practical jokes and talking shit to everybody. He was just one of those. He couldn't have, he was the trickster like Trump. You just never knew when the truth starts and the fiction begins. That's one and thing the they story. lost in the film, right? The, the Baz Luhrmann film it was yeah. that side of him, right? Don't you feel like, I mean, they showed him as so serious self-serious yeah yeah i agree with you johnny and uh but he could only do so much yeah but elvis was just a big prankster so you don't know about this what we do know is interest which he was open and his ability i mean he would have loved watching you know tin foil hat and all those oh, things because he believed me. he believed that you know as soon as jfk was killed he was one of the few people who would tell the press there's, a, you know, the the one shooter thing is doesn't make sense. Somebody's hiding. He thought the Vatican was hiding uh, secrets. He was like red pill before red pill was a thing or conspiracy was a thing. Again, he was uh, ahead of his time in America's egregore. But 
he believed in this stuff and then he had about three or four experiences one was at his bel air home he was sitting there with uh, i think it was sunny west and it was uh, elvis you could sit there outside for hours staring at the stars without moving and sometimes he said he would actually travel these things but he was an introvert he just liked chilling out and just kind of enjoying the moment but he was out there and they see this light over the the trees and elvis is like well what's that and sunny west is like well it's probably a helicopter or a plane and elvis is like uh it's not making any noise and they're both staring they're like oh shit, this is a ufo so elvis gets his uh sunny west's bodyguard friend to go in and get another guy some of the other people of the memphis mafia they come out and elvis is gone and the lights like moving and they're like oh shit, elvis got abducted and they couldn't <laughs> find him and they're like screaming and eventually he's like uh over here and he's like two houses down in his neighbor's yard just staring at the sky and he's like sorry fellas they left the other one happened in graceland with his father vernon and his spiritual advisor larry geller they were outside they heard this light and they saw these discs this disc coming up and moving across and they're all just shitting their pants and then Elvis was like, oh, what? And they started talking about the philosophical things and all this other stuff. And Vern and his father remembered then something like woke him up. But when Elvis was born in his little shack in Tupelo, Mississippi, that night that twins were born and one of the twins died and Elvis lived, which he never forgot. But Vernon went outside to have a cigarette because they were having the child at home because they couldn't afford a hospital. Oh, my God, that's crazy. But uh, Vernon suddenly looked around and this blue light flew into the air and covered his house and all sound was sucked in. It was completely Whoa. silent. Nothing moved. And Vernon was like, oh, shit. And he ran inside freaking out. But when he ran inside, unfortunately, Jesse died. And somehow that memory disappeared. And he told Elvis about it. And Elvis was like, oh, my God, am I was I dropped here, dropped here by the alien mothership or some angel? I mean, what was going on? So those are a few if you want to hear some more. But yeah, a Elvis and UFOs are just so go hand in hand. You, it's almost like you can't talk one without the other elvis was all about the extraterrestrial his favorite show was star trek he loves star trek one of his favorite movies was 2001 a space odyssey that's how we started all his vegas show with the with the Aww. song thus spake zarathustra he was he was a big science fiction ufo believer experiencer whatever you want to call him what do you think ufos are i don't think they're from other planets. I think they're either interdimensional angels. That's what and I demons. am these days. What do you yeah, think? I'm, yeah, I'm, I think I'm that. Yeah. Kind of uh, um, Keel's uh, intradimensional Mothman can oh, move through shit. things. That's where I am these days. I think that's some, the one that makes That's my model until more data comes in. We had uh, Greg Reese on last week and he brought up that he thought the tree of life. That the, the many ball, you know, that you see, the, the the ball on the bottom, then the two balls and the ball in the middle and all that stuff. And um, he thought that had to do with the, the dimensions as well and that this is the lowest dimension. And, oh, cool. yeah. you know, that this is the material. I really start getting into that, that. This is the material and that this is the lowest level. And this could be the hell in which we all talk about, right? And, you know... Adam Eve eating the apple, all that stuff. Well, I, I, I'm open minded to it all. I, I am never going to be like this is it. I'm going to have my own personal beliefs, but I'll listen to everybody. Uh, what if what if entities from those other balls in the tree of life occasionally come down here? That's why I'm starting to think it might be. I, I do believe that. I do believe the Vedics talk about that a lot. That Very there's much, many yeah. different levels. Johnny got a question. Well, no, I mean, just there's this idea too that you you could be there can be people that you can see that are living in a different level than you. You know, I mean, those might all be here in one. You get what I'm saying? Like, I could be this could be my personal hell, and you're living a you know a, a different experience completely. Well, the, I totally believe in that every human is in his own dimension. And yeah, I mean, think that's about a way that. To think about it for but sure. Like uh, the people walk around with. I mean, at the airport, they got two masks on. Yeah. I'm like you're wearing you're not just wearing one you're going back, you're going straight to two masks. 
Like we're th- in the thick of COVID in 2019 is that, or 2020. Is that what you're telling me right now? That's their Airport dimension. And their cars. Even in their cars. Yeah, I, I, I just, those those are, I, I go, you're an NPC, you don't think. You're just here for texture. I don't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful to you. Because even my mother doesn't wear a mask and she's paranoid as shit. So if the fact, you got to be so deep into that, that you're wearing two masks. Two. So uh, we brought up life and death and uh, you said you were open-minded. And we're, this is a conspiracy show. Is uh, Elvis Presley dead? Did he fucking uh, cover up his death yeah. for the mafia? Is that are we bringing that up at all? Is that a possibility? Man, we, we would have to no, do he's another probably dead show by either. now. He's probably dead by now. But like you know how his mis- uh, his tombstone was his name was misspelled. Are we yeah. that we running into any of that? I am. There, I have a whole chapter on it. Yeah. Well, what's I mean, your there's thoughts? so much. It's like I mean, even there's so many conspiracies you could spend forever. The only one that always jumps out at me. Is that when you look at his death certificate, it looks like his own handwriting, and experts have said, Yeah, this is a good chance is his own handwriting. Mm. But other than that, yeah, there is so many rabbit holes to uh to follow this to see. I mean, again, he is more alive than ever. You can go run out to the Graceland website and they have a page dedicated to Elvis sightings. I mean, <laughs> just, almost as much as Jesus, Marilyn Monroe, JFK, he is really the most alive figure in American culture. He really is America. I know there's a lot of apocryphal uh, knowledge about this, but what, what what do you think caused his death if he did die then? What, what, what eventually? Well, I died? say he knew about it and it's a ceremony. Now, there's obviously people say it was a heart attack and the drugs, but uh, there's all these clues that I write about in the book. For example, Memphis is Egyptian for the land between two places. And I always said, Elvis, the trickster is always at the crossroads, so is the shaman. So it had to be Elvis. He died at 42. 42 is a very important number in Egyptian, ancient Egyptian lore, because when you die, bro, I've heard that. That's, that's for the yeah the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Other play occultism. It's a huge number. Yeah, but there's in some Egyptian darkness lore, with the number forty two too. The the Dark Mother. I just did an episode on that. That is super yeah. interesting. Go on. Yeah, yeah, but forty two. When you die, you go in front of Osiris or Matt, and you have to recite forty two negative sins. In other words, forty two things that you didn't do that were bad in your life. If you can recite the forty two. Then you're the feather weight thing, and then but it helps you weighing the thing. He oh was, my uh, god, we gotta come up with forty two things that we didn't do. Yes, forty three. I would just be making up stuff. <laughs> they know so <laughs> bad <laughs> karate katas, <laughs> dirty dancing in public. What else? I mean, I'd, I'd just be, I, I, I'd be, I'd be going so deep. <laughs> oh man, I'm coming back. Damn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or you, the crocodile god will devour you. But so that you, you had that. He was dressed in his. Whenever he was down or he was doing a magical ceremony, he would wear blue. He was wearing his crucifix, uh, Jewish symbol, and an ankh. People f- no don't want to tell you. Elvis walked around with an Egyptian ankh. It was very important to him. That day, he manipulated some weather for some friends. He sang a song with blue whenever he was going to go in into the altar state of mind. It would be blue. He, of course, the symbolic thing of the throne, but people don't realize the only place he was ever alone where he could read and meditate was in his bathroom. So a lot of the times he wasn't even shitting. And the book he read, he was a voracious, he was reading a book about uh, evidence to the scientific face of Jesus, about the Shroud of Turin and what Jesus might have looked. So symbolically, he knew he was going to meet Jesus. Plus, there's all the things he told friends and family before. He basically told them, my time is coming. I'm leaving. He told, for example, he told his stepbrother, David Stanley, two days before. He went, uh, David, the next time you see me, I'm going to be on a higher plane. And his stepbrother was like, oh, we're going on a plane to Portland. Is that what you mean? And Elvis just smiled and shrugged and walked away. So I put all this evidence that, like a shaman in a tribe, he knew that it was his time to leave this avatar and go to the next world. So he ascended almost. I mean, that's what it sounds like. 
Yeah, and he was never afraid of death. He he used to go to morgues just to hang out and look at the body. He would take Priscilla. He, you know, again, shamans do this. He would go and he had a friend die once and he sat through the autopsy and was very scientific about the organs and all that. But again, yeah, going to the morgue after watching horror movies was one of his favorite pastimes. Yeah, was there some what? darkness to him as well? I mean, like, obviously, you know, at, listen, at the time... Dating younger women wasn't seen the same way. It just wasn't. But he did like them young. You know, going to the morgue and seeing your friend get an autopsy is super weird to me. Was there some darkness to Elvis, in your opinion? Some They danced with the, the dark side that yeah. it caught up with him with drugs and alcohol. And then, yeah, obviously, the, the colonel, I mean, who knows what dark energy that guy brought into the world. And... And if he was such a shaman, why couldn't he get away from the colonel, in your opinion? Well, I think, the, again, this is what boomers like act like the colonel was the devil. As, as I write in the book, the current, I mean, look at, you see Hermes, I mean, you see Elvis as Hermes or Steiner's Lucifer. He's just this crazy, creative energy, just no rules, no boundaries. But in alchemy, Mercury needs to be tempered by Saturn, the Lord Araman, the Lord of rules and numbers and all that. When you put them together, that's when you have the true philosopher's stone. I think that's what the colonel was. And even uh, people would say, yeah, they didn't like each other, but they love power even more. When they got together again, it was the left brain and the right brain, the Hermes and the Saturn energies. And it just clicked perfectly. Elvis took care of the art. The colonel took care of the numbers. And they really never really got in each other's way. I mean, Elvis never really cared about money. The colonel could care less what Elvis did on stage or in his personal life. Or if he was a drug addict, he just let, let Elvis do Elvis and would show him, write him checks. So, But yeah, Elvis was dark because he was a shaman. He, he wanted to understand death. Uh, the shaman travels to the underworld to look for treasures. But he also loved life, too. He loved children. He loved animals. One of his greatest passions, he wanted to see uh, to see a woman give birth, but they wouldn't let him Aww. in those days and all that. So it was a... Uh, and, you know, and as the drugs began to take over... Yeah, the mood swings, the depression, the violence, uh, the shooting up televisions got worse and worse. There were periods of shooting lucidity. Up it, that was the thing he liked to do. That's television. just a different time, bro. Yeah, shooting yeah, yeah. up your shooting up your TV that would be met with such chaos right now. It's pretty be kind of or fun, break though, toilets, it would be or, great to yeah. shoot your television, especially one when time. the CNN is just going on like Don Lynn, or he's not there anymore. But you know, one of these idiots is just going and just be like mother. Like the closest Shit. thing to that is grabbing your phone and smashing it. Yeah. yeah. And it's not worth it because there's so much on that phone. Yeah, you're like, oh, come on, buddy. Oh, here's another one of my favorite stories, how magical Elvis was. He bought like a $30,000 Pantera. I never heard of it, but in the 70s, whatever. And 30000 today, it was like an $80,000 car. Yeah, brand for new. sure. He takes Linda Thompson. He wants to take her out on a date. Uh, he goes and the car won't start. And he's like, Rrr. and he gets mad. He gets out, takes out his gun. He shoots the car five times what? in the engine, gets back in, and the car turns on. That's amazing. That's how Elvis was. He could make anything happen that he wanted. And they just drove off. She's it's funny. You out. hear about these kinds of guys. I've heard uh, friends who are in the military talk about these kinds of guys. It's even like that scene in Apocalypse Now where he's talking about the colonel, or not the colonel, but uh, uh, Robert Duvall's character. No. Uh, and he's like, you, you just knew that this guy wasn't going to get a scratch the whole time. Elvis yeah, is one yeah. of those guys that, you know, you hear about these guys in the military. They're just walking through bullets. And, and, and didn't they, they say you that just about know him? they're not going to die. There's a famous story, and I, I, I don't believe it. It just fits in there about Hitler was like that. Hitler was on the battlefield in like World War I oh, really? and just walking. They said yeah. walking the field and a guy had a clear shot. And he didn't take oh, oh, it. Oh, no, you're thinking about George Washington. There was a, there's, no, well, there's a story, a famous story about George Washington was in the sights of an enemy sniper, and they could have shot him. And there's there's some like that in the Civil War, too. Like, 
generals not getting taken out. I don't know if any of those are genuine or. I just did uh, an intro based on the sh- movie White Noise, and the Adam Driver guy does a, a speech with uh, uh, Don Sheedley about the parallels of Hitler and Elvis. That they're both were mama's boys, huh. and most of their life, you can make a case that everything they did was to honor their mom and try to bring their mom back to life or whatever. They were both so traumatized and they never grew out of the shadow of their mom. And that was part of their success and part of their dark side. Yeah, there was a Captain Patrick Ferguson, a 33-year-old Scotsman, uh, was reputed to be the finest shot in the British Army. And uh, he just, there's something about George Washington's... Uh, you know, appearance, Aura. his gravitas. Yeah, it was just, it was, he could Okay, too. so I want to get into this. I want to get into this, into this notion of assimilation that almost in like the Matrix, in the Agent Smith thing, where if certain entities can take over people and now they're Agent Smith. Mm-hmm. I think that happens in in this simulation right now have you ever been driving and you want to take this turn and all of a sudden the car from the other end just suddenly turns and then just stop and you're like why do you what why did that just happen right now i think that each one of us is almost an npc in the other person's thing they're not an npc but we are players in your experience and that we can be picked to go do certain things be like walk that way that's there is, I mean, there's that's a, there's some biblical basis for that. You know, the will of God uh, being you know something that we have some limited, or maybe more than limited, uh, agency within. But then there are these times where you know that we, we can be taken over to do stuff. I, I mean, it's not and maybe that, but it's that, possible. I, I would say. I mean, that's why that, that guy didn't take that shot. Yeah, well, that's that's what I'm wondering. I mean, this is his quote. He says, I could have lodged a half a dozen balls in or about him before he was out of my reach, Ferguson recalled, but it was not pleasant to fire at the back of an unoffending individual, listen to the way he talks, who was acquitting himself very coolly of his duty, so I'd let him alone. Yeah. Mm. What a nice guy. Well, (laughs) good thing you did, because now we have America. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) yeah, and you hear about, I mean, Washington, everything you hear about Washington is that he was the only guy who could have done that. What what the job that he had to do? He was uniquely he was the man. I'm telling you, dude, we, we're all uh, have pass. And it sounds like Elvis was one of these men suited yes, to his time. Yeah, for yeah, sure, yeah. I told yeah, you. Whatever he wanted, the people you say he could, he knew what people wanted. He could change the mood of the room. He could read the room. He had an intuition for anything. And as I've talked, he could literally bend reality when he wanted to manipulate weather shoot things uh make cars run just over and over and all these stories are well documented by girlfriends priscilla family i mean he was a a truly a living magician and truly somebody who changed history and really was part of the culture we live in today and when your attention is like the you know the the sun's rays uh, you can hurt people too by by kind of changing you know changing the subject of your attention you know you i mean you hear about Elvis, you know, women especially that he kind of, you know, scorned. But it's it's really just because his attention was such a valuable. You know what I mean? It, it kind of well, that, the, that had that whole, magic to it. And this is what we're going through right now with all this cancel culture stuff. Is like women are attracted to power. Yeah, yeah. And now they're complaining that there's a power dynamic. Of course there is. You're a female attracted to the most powerful alphas. That there's always going to be a power dynamic there. And if it doesn't work out the way you want it, you become a scorned lover. And it's just like, this is just the way it is, man. And especially now this, and that fits into what they're, they're studying in all this data that's coming out of these dating apps that like hundred percent of women are only attracted to 20% of the men, which is just Hmm. impossible. Yeah. They're all, right? fighting, they're all fighting for 20% of them. Yeah, and, and, and those well, guys... Well, you know the apps, too, that are more expensive for men? They yeah. make, like, Tinder especially, apparently, is more expensive of for course, men. Of course, bro, because that's just, the I way mean, you keep out you... a lot of the garbage. That's why there, a lot of these con- these nightclubs have uh, mission fees. You have, because garbage won't show up. I got I to pay 20 bucks to get in. F that. How do I know that? Because I won't pay 20 bucks to get in. <laughs> How do you well, think they do that? Why do you think drinks are so expensive? Because they know only guys with money can afford a $17 right, drink. Right, which like, uh, entices women to show yeah. up. 
That's why women like the more expensive stuff, because it means they're dealing with a higher sense of alpha. But now what they've done is weaponize it. Like when you take a shot at 20% and it doesn't work out for you, you want to cry victim. Like, no, man, this is the mating process. It's just the way it is, man. And like I used to watch Chris Lee at the comedy store. And women, like, literally would present themselves. And now they're trying to act like he's a predator? Dude, it's, like, crazy <laughs> to me. You think the world's a better place if Chris Lee is in jail? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Please I do stop. think something, too. This, I think that's why some women, at least, are seeking, mm, uh, what would you say? Financial? BDSM. Uh, because they're, it's just their relationship to authority in life and, and men. They're seeking out weaker men in life. But they need to, that's got to be compensated for somewhere else. You know what I mean? It's well, what they're doing is they buy into the psyop that nerd dudes are cool, and then when they get with them, saying, yeah. they're like, "I'm not liking this." And then they get with an alpha, and they get gorilla fucked, and then they're like, "Oh, that's what I really like. I I've been lied to my whole life. I like to get smashed, bro." But then it turns into a kink because th that can't possibly Isn't be the that truth. Crazy? What you're saying, yeah. like a man being dominant. And a woman being submissive it's is kink, now considered yeah. a kink. Yeah. Yeah. We mm. live in the inverted, dude. That's what I'm telling you. It's an inverted world. It's it's all the yeah. shows like like uh, that Modern Family. That guy's such a fucking simp, lame. The husband, where you know she's fucking him. How about every commercial is yeah. like, <laughs> oh, I can't wipe my butt. Thank you, wife, for getting me. You know, Downey. You know, it's like, what are we talking about here? It's like. It's like, it's crazy. And then they're not happy in the relationship and they only date unavailable men because those guys don't care about social norms. They're just like, I'm a man. I'm a knuckle dragger. That's He's why I worry about young boys. You know, like what, what are they going to grow up with when all their role models are these sort of beta? But you know, that, that's why I think TV. the internet's totally changing the game. Whether it's sometimes for bad, but a lot of times there's some guys that are like, dude, be you, be your man. Show so, your boys Elvis. Oh, always, dude. Like you, uh, always. Like uh, Patrick Bed Davis. To me, it's hard to. Uh, to me, it's hard to be an influential man to man to boys if you're not married or have a wife, because they will always demonize you. Like Pat Patrick Bed Davis, it's always hard to talk shit on him when he always brings up his kids. Yeah, his wife and how great it is. And you're I like, love that guy. Yeah, so big. I mean, they just they listen. We live in a world where if you get big enough, if your name isn't being said by trolls, you're not doing anything well. That's just the way it is. See, but what I'm trying to say is if he was single and he wasn't married and he didn't have kids, he would have already been some allegation, yep. some bullshit. But since he's married, he's like, dude, I'm married. I'm set down. Life is yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, And it's just that's the only way because Andrew Tate had to come out that he had a daughter now. Remember, he was hiding the daughter, and now he has a daughter. Is he in her life? Yeah, he yeah, after like nine months, there was a video of him like, Oh, well, that's great. Like nine I months. mean, that's the blessings, dude. The kids are the blessing. Miguel, you crush. One more time. Tell them where they can find you. Yes, uh, the God Above God uh, is the website. Or again, just type in in your uh, your uh, whatever address bar, search engine, whatever. A on Byte, A E O N, sec Byte, B Y T E, Gnostic Radio, if you want, and I will pop up. You can go to the website. All my stuff is there. If you want to talk to me, send me a message or reach out to me on social. And uh, nothing on Elvis there because, again, the book is recently being accepted by the publisher. We only, I think we did about 5% of maybe less of the book. So hopefully we can talk about it later because there's still so much more. I talk about the eerie similarities of Elvis and Philip K. Dick, uh, more of the reasons why I try to deal you know, as somebody like you, Sam, in recovery, I try to deal with alternative reasons why Elvis fell fell into his addiction and how he might have come out of it. I deal with the whole cons with Johnny Broad, all the conspiracy theories and Elvis sightings, and there's just so much more. But hopefully, it'll make it. The Elvis stuff will eventually make it to my website. Ah, uh, I agree, man. I agree. Well, Miguel, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for listening. So I just want to tell you, again, samtriplee.com. Go check out all of our stuff, uh, my dates. We have, we're have we going to tell you a little bit about our affiliate programs. We should check them out. 
t-shirts. We got new t-shirts all the time. Support the show. I'm going to start doing hopefully some premium content back on with samtriplee.com so you can get all that there. Rockfin's a great way to support me. If you want to support a whole bunch of uh, of uh, of these content creators or I'm going to do something on samtriplee.com where you can just support me. T-shirts, audio, video, everything samtriplee.com. Uh, is here. We're just going hard in the paint. Going to start doing some shows on there as well. And uh, I would just hang out and check out uh, uh, an explanation of who we're working with in our affiliate programs and some highlights from some of our other podcasts. Here's a clip from the latest Broken Sim. Uh, you just went to do Rogan. Are you going to talk about that at all? Uh, how was Austin? Like, what was that club like? Is it? Does it remind you of the old story? Oh, I have yeah. so many questions. Oh, my God, bro. Oh, my God. What? We never what? talked about no, Austin no, yet? No, 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 no. Wow, it's been that. Uh, you know, it's so funny. It seems like it's. I, honestly, it seems like I was on there months ago, but it's only like seven days. No, yeah, it wasn't that long ago at all. Um, it was eight days now. Um, it was amazing. It was like such a blessing to be. You know, I always talk about this. Like maybe they don't even know it, but I always felt like my my drug abuse caused a little wedge between those me and a lot of those. Those guys, not that they hated me, but it's like, uh, dude, you got to figure out your shit. No, you know? that's exactly what I meant earlier. Like, I was wondering if there was any of that feeling. Like, yeah, I felt like, man, maybe, maybe, like, I, I've earned my way back in to hang out. And I'm going to tell you something, Johnny. So I'm running with Rogan, and before we go do the podcast, Rogan's like, let's go to the club, and let's go see Andrew Schultz. So I'm like, okay, cool. So we go with, uh, we go, Rogan brings us in, and I'm walking through Rogan's club with Rogan. Yeah, that's like walking through the White House. I was with like, the this is kind of cool. It's like, crazy, for, for just being like a dick joke comic <laughs> yeah, yeah. from upstate New York, it's kind of cool. He probably feels the same way, too, dude. He's, I mean, you know, he's a you dick know? joke comic. But, Johnny, when I tell you this club is gorgeous, is it, it is gorgeous. Like, that main room is the one of the most beautiful rooms I've ever seen in my life. Everything uh, is, is it set up for comedy? Like, oh, dude, yeah. jo Johnny, it is. There is, there is. Everything is the greatest detail I've ever seen in my life. That makes the it, lighting. The guy's, he's obsessive. I mean, that makes total. Sense. I mean, dude, there's no better lighting. There's no better lighting than that main room at the whatever is it called? The big boy. Yeah, I think the big after boy, the, bombs, the little right? man, right? Yeah. The most gorgeous fat, thing fat I've ever seen in my life. Whatever, yeah. yeah, it's the, it's a fat man and a little boy. Uh the most gorgeous room I've ever seen in my life. So, you know, and everyone's like, hey, you're going to go up? Because it's all comedy store people. I'm like, oh, I don't want to bother anybody, yo, know, because that's who I am. Then I hit so up. So you saw a lot of faces? like All like, the staff is old comedy Really? Store. Oh, that's cool, man. It, it is good, cool, Good for bro. him for doing that. Too. And then, like, dude, all the fucking security are all, like, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu guys. It's pretty cool, my I'd friend Zach. Know, I'd love to know if he's making money off that or if this is just like a pat. You know, like Steve Cohen owning the Mets. I, like, I wonder if, because he's just losing money. I wonder if this is like I Rogan's think I, I think he's generous with how he takes care of everybody. I imagine so, yeah. I get that vibe from everything I've heard. That. But, but the club opening has caused a ripple effect. What do you mean? So I want to get, let me, before I get into the comedy of yeah, Austin... Go let me get into, so I'm going to say something right now. I go in the green room. It's, it's, it's Andrew Schultz and his whole crew minus the, the, uh, the one co-host he has, the Indian guy. He's not there. Cause I think that guy's on his own journey, right? When he's, he's headlining places, yeah, which yeah. he's crushing it. Right. He's, I, I don't, I don't I watch never, that show that much, so I don't know much. About but you know, it's like that guy did, uh, what is his name? Can you look up his name? Cause I hate, fucking what's the name of that podcast? I can't remember. Um, flagrant too, I oh, think yeah. it's called. Um, but you know, that yeah, guy Sam has this real like guilt about getting people's names, especially wrong. other comedians who I love. Uh, Akash Singh. Yeah. He, he, he's supposedly a really nice guy. Like he was at the, uh, was he always on that show. I don't know him. Yeah, he was. He wasn't like replacing someone else or anything. Like when I mess up Chris Stefano's name, I felt like a piece of shit to the point I wanted to text him. Yeah, and yeah, we were. If you didn't hear that, it was a Temple Hat episode where you know he just got his name wrong. It's an easy name to get wrong, and it, Sam was so crushed about that. He wanted me to edit it out, but there was no. He talked about it too much after, and I, there was just no edit point for it. Yeah, so I, was I feel either cut the whole conversation about him out, or and he was. I mean, he genuinely takes that hard, Sam. Does. So I'm going to say something right now. Hanging out with Rogan, hanging out with Callen Shab.
That was a Saturday night you did that? And, and Schultz. On? I'm going to tell you something, man. Go on. Watching Schultz and watching a, a Joe Rogan interact with each other, I get why they're as big as they are. What do you mean by that? I just, their flow in the room. What, but interact, like with the crowd? or No, with, with each other. Just how everybody was talking to each other. They had natural, I just can't. I can't explain it other than I go, oh, like I, jokes, like they were they were riffing jokes or? and perspectives, and you just there's a flow to it. Whereas me, I like to be blunt force trauma. I feel like that's my thing. I like pull no punches. I think in a weird way, so I am where I am, and it's like, yeah, I get shadow banned, but in reality, those guys are exceptional at what they do. And I, and I see. There's some kind of star quality, is what you're saying. There, there's some kind of like it's a star quality, but it's also a flow thing that is like I. But what would their rapport with each other have to do with them being? Well, it just got to be like successful. the questions they were asking, the answers they were getting. I go, okay, I get it. I, but what were they? Maybe talking about? I can't explain. Are they it. talking about podcasting? They're or just talking about everything going anything. on. Okay. They're just all riffing. Okay. And I go, oh, I get it. I see it. I you understand. got it there, but not when, on his podcast where he's. I mean, I, I just, no, but no, no, no. I get that, but it's like it's like when I when I'm on Joe Rogan's podcast or anybody's podcast, their podcast is kind of like tailored to fit me at that moment. Did you, you get understand? nervous? Did you get nervous for the podcast? No. Well, no. Okay. Because you know those guys forever. Because. I knew when you think about how many people you're talking to, that should make you the most. Nervous it doesn't of anything make that. In I didn't because, like, listen. When I say I get why they're big, I get. I I think I'm good at this as well. I'm not saying I'm great, and I'm not saying I'm okay with people going. You're not. Sam's not funny. I'm. I, I will accept that. I get it. I'm not funny. I totally get it. I'm fine with that. But I think I, uh, I I personally think I'm pretty good at this. So I just knew that I was in a room full of people that love me, and that I just the, the biggest thing to do was when you're in a show on any show like that with the three, just don't talk over anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what I like to do is almost like flavor flavor it, where it's like sniping, right? Yeah, like a couple jokes here. But add to whatever they're saying to try to make it yeah. even better. Yeah, it's funny when at the early on when I think it was uh, Callan was trying to tell a story and you wanted to say something really funny, like some point, I can't remember what it was, but it, it really had a lot to do with the story and Rogan was like, don't interrupt. And I knew Sam in his head was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I got oh, Yeah, fuck. you don't want to do that. Yeah, no. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I knew that. that. And it, you, I know you took that very seriously. I get to see Well, it dude, it. that's it because it's like, I'll watch some people do shows and they just talk over each other. I go, okay, the key is just... To wait till anybody, not even just Rogan, but Callan or Shab, when they're done talking, if there's a pause, jump in, say something to add to the conversation. You got to be a good hang. What? You, you have to be a good yeah, hang. 100%. Yeah. yeah and, and Zoom, that's why Zoom sucks. Because that timing, that moment when you can jump in is impossible to get on Zoom. Like yeah. You just can't quite get it. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. So we went there. It was great. Let me tell you about Austin, dude. Now a clip from Conspiracy Social Club. The military worked with corporations to move manufacturing out of the United States so they could destroy the middle class, wouldn't be able to find work, and hopefully join the military so they could become a cog in a death machine called the military-industrial complex. Those are facts, whether you like it or not. Sam, you, you are... So, so you're telling me, you're telling me that a company whether it's a textile company or something, that could cut costs by exporting labor overseas. That, that was somehow a military-industrial complex Yeah, thing? 100%. Like, but th that just made financial sense. Why, why is that some big Because conspiracy? it was incentivized by the U.S. military. No, That's why. No, it wasn't. <laughs> incentivized. Brian, Brian, wait, Brian, oh, wait, wait, Brian, wait. Wait, Brian. China's development? Brian. Wait, China's... Three hundred and fifty million, no, million part of middle it, but class not, workers. Not everything went to China. That was that was incentivized right. by the literally US military. the U.S. military. Oh. Oh. 
Hey guys, you guys know Tim Fall Hats for the people. We want people to live a better life and, and get stuff in positive vibrational stuff in their life. So we want to tell you about some of our, our affiliate programs real quick. We got Wise Wolf, Gold and Silver. If you're looking for precious metals, these are the best in the business, okay? I'm part of this Wise Wolf, Wise Wolf package program. I spend a certain amount of money every month and they send me precious metals and I love it. It's a great way to get ready for the financial collapse. We have Aqua Cure, hydrogen brown gas. Listen, we we've we've talked about before. If you want to look younger, it's a great way. Uh, check it out. You click the banner. You use the promo code Tinfall Hat. Our friends at Harley Ray Candles and Crystals. Go check it out. If you use Swarm. 15, you'll get 15% off. They got candles. They have, uh, what? Uh, click on it real quick. Sage. Sage. Crystals. They got crystals. They got everything you might need. And all you got to do is use the promo. Look at that one right there. I want to get that aqua blue. I should just ask them to send it to them, us. Aqua blue at uh, 55, $55 promo code Swarm 15, you get 15% off that. Very excited to be you working with Tim James over at Chemical Free Body. That's right. Give 5% off all of his products, everything he's doing with the promo code Tin Foil Hat. I love his vitamins and nutrients. I take them all the time. They are the best and it helps me get my body going. And if you're lo looking to lose weight, let's say you're, 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 you got, you're a busy dad, busy mom out there, go check out Joel Staley. He's helped me lose weight. Uh, he's got a whole program to lose weight, get in shape, all that stuff. Just click the, the banner and use the promo code Tin fall hat, three words, and you can get shape. It worked for me. It can work for you. Hope you guys enjoy these and uh, check out the highlights. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. <laughs> Eric, open your mind. <laughs> Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. <laughs> That's some interdimensional <laughs> shit. <laughs> up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Tim foil hat, Tim foil hat, Tim foil hat.